Song 71 that we just sang, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned, unclean. It's a testimony that many of us here would have to share, isn't it? A testimony of how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. And that is the theme on which we will be listening to this night. Allow me to draw your attention once again, for those of us who, have, who are here this afternoon, to the story of Jonah. And look at the gospel through the narrative of that book. Jonah is not a mere work of fiction. His story is not one that came out of man's imagination, but in fact it is a real story of a real person and his real experiences. Jonah's story, in summary, to save time, is this. Jonah is a man who was a Jew, and being born a Jew, he lived amongst his people, and while doing so, he receives one day a commandment from God, saying, go to Nineveh and declare unto them my judgment on them. Jonah receives the message, but he chooses to do the exact opposite of what God had commanded him. He goes in a ship away from the direction that God was directing him in. He chose to disobey that commandment. He chose to reject God's revealed will for him. The Bible says that disobedience is sin, and the punishment of sin is also clear. Romans 6.23, for those of us who know that passage, it states it clearly. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. And Jonah, being a prophet, would certainly have known that. A man who knew the Ten Commandments a man who from his birth knew the laws and had memorized them all and was himself a prophet and therefore a person who would be living it out in front of the people there. He knew definitely the cost of what he was doing. And so, while in the ship, God causes a storm to overtake them, a terrible storm, one that tossed the ship in which he was sailing to and fro and all around, and it was beyond control. And the expert sailors who were there on the ship, they could do nothing. And all they had before them was cry out in fear, in fear to their gods and pray to them. And that's all they could do for a few moments until Jonah was woken up. He comes up to the top of the ship and he tells them, that the only way out for you now is to throw me overboard. Jonah knew what he was stating. He knew that this was going to be certain death, but he also knew that this was the consequence of his rebellion, of his disobedience. The wages of sin is death. And Jonah knew for certain that he was going to die. We also know who, those of us who know the story know what happens next. The sailors on that ship do exactly what Jonah told them. They pick him up and throw him overboard into that storm. They were helpless. They had no other choice other than what Jonah was giving them. And they did just that. They threw him overboard. And Jonah sank in the midst of that storm, in that darkness, 
into the depths of the ocean. As the light from that ship, as the light from the stars above in the heavens, as it started to dim and dim and dim, and perhaps Jonah was losing consciousness, we see in that story that a big, a giant fish swallows him. And all of a sudden, he's in complete darkness. And he remains in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights, in complete darkness, in a place where it would be stinking, smelling so bad, with no idea of time as it was going by, with no one to help him, nobody near him, and with no idea where in the world he literally was. And the third day, the story goes, God commands the whale to spew him out. The whale rises up from the bottom of the ocean, comes up to the shore near Nineveh, and spits him out. That was the story of Jonah. But Jonah is also a very good picture of the gospel as well. We too, like Jonah, have a commandment. In fact, we look at the Bible and Genesis begins with God's clear commandment to Adam. We look at the Old Testament and we see God's clear commandments to the Israelites. We know of the Ten Commandments and they are not the only part of, that, of the commandments but just a small part of the great majority. And if we are people who think that we are not part of Israel and so don't have a commandment, look at Romans chapter 2 verse 14 and 15 which clearly outlines that in man's heart in his conscience God has already written that down all of us are given a commandment by God and what has been the response that we as mankind have had toward that commandment have shown toward that commandment exactly what Jonah did take a look at Romans chapter 3 verse 10 through to verse 12. Romans chapter 3 verse 10 through to verse 12. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. This is a blanket statement. And it pictures the entirety of humanity within it. From Adam down to the last man. No, not one. There is none righteous. No, not one. We have all sinned. Look at Romans 3, chapter 3, verse 23. It makes it explicitly clear. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Again, a blanket statement. For all have sinned. And as we already saw, what is the result of sin? What happens when one sins? Romans 6.23 makes that clear. The wages of sin is death. And there is no escape from it. Just as Jonah and the sailors there had no other choice there was no way forward for them from within that storm. We too have no choice when it comes to this punishment of death, when it comes to the wages of sin. There is no escape from it. But this is where the story changes. You see, God, in his holiness, in his righteousness, cannot tolerate sin at all and his anger is ever present towards sin and it is overwhelming just as that storm was overwhelming for Jonah and for the sailors to handle the, themselves so also is God's wrath his anger towards sin is not something we can control it's not something we can put in a bottle and just close and leave it to the side and forget about it God's anger and God's attitude towards sin is uncompromising. And because of our sin, 
The judgment upon us is God's wrath. That same wrath that is overwhelming. That is God's judgment upon us. And we too, just like Jonah and the sailors, by ourselves can do nothing about it. We cannot help ourselves, we cannot help anyone else, and nobody else can help us. We are left with no choice. This is where Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through to verse 8, if you can read that as well. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through to verse 8 comes into the picture. Romans 5, 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet, peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 6 says, For when we were yet without strength, we were hopeless, there was no means of escape that we could connive by ourselves. There was nothing we could think of. There was nothing we could do. We were weak in that, in our sins. We are weak in our sins. We cannot save ourselves. And in that situation, we see what God does. Christ died for the ungodly. This passage makes it clear. Christ died for me. Christ died for you. And he died in my place. He died in your place. Christ was there upon the cross receiving upon himself the full fury of God's judgment. He hung there unto the very end until God's judgment was complete. Until his justice was satisfied, he drained it to the last drop. And then he bows down his head and says, it is finished. And then he dies. Why? Why did Christ do that? That is answered in verse 8. When it says, but God commendeth his love toward us. Or in a simpler version it would say, but God showed his love toward us. God chose to love me. And God chooses to love you too. And that is why Christ died on the cross. That is why Christ was there hanging on that cross for you and for me. Look at what Christ truly did. Let's just ponder upon it for a moment. Beginning in the Garden of Gethsemane, where we find him in agony, where it states that the sweat that was dropping off from his body was not just sweat, it was big drops of blood. That was how much he was in agony. And then once he was arrested, we see also how he was tortured. And the four gospels make, makes that picture very, very clear. There is no detail left out, is there? He's whipped. He's whipped to the point where his body must have been drained of blood itself. He's whipped to the point where his flesh would have been torn apart to the point where his bones would have been visible through them. And that doesn't end there either. He was still beaten. A crown of thorns was placed upon his head. And this was not a few mi- uh, something that happened just for a few minutes. It was not torture endured for half an hour or an hour. It was for a prolonged period of time. Hours went by of him enduring this. And then at the end, he carries a heavy cross. Tired, a body that is in shock 
is forced to carry a heavy cross all the way from the praetorium to Calvary, which is outside of the city walls. And the Bible says that he was unable to carry it all the way. His body could not bear that burden. It was too tired. It was exhausted. It was drained of all its energy. But he chose to continue on. He lay there on the cross, allowing people to nail his hands and his feet and then be raised up. A picture of humiliation. A picture of cruelty. And yet it says here, God chose to do so. God chose that this happen. And do you know what God asks in return? Nothing. That's the incredible part. He asks nothing in return. Romans chapter 6.23 itself, it says this, Romans 6.23. It makes it clear, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Wow. He asks nothing but offers what he has done as a gift. That is incredible. That's the marvel. That's the wonder that we've been singing about. Such a heavy price was paid that day 2,000 years ago when Jesus was hanging on the cross. It was a heavy price. And God worked out salvation through it. And God says, I'm keeping it right in front of you, before your very eyes. Here it is. Just take it. It is free. That's how he is giving it to us. When we hear the word free, often we take it very lightly. Whatever is free must probably be very cheap. It's probably not very valuable. It might not be a good idea to even get it. That's, all, that's one of the things that uh, today's products would teach us. But then what God offers here in salvation is not something you get on Amazon or on Temu or one of those apps which offers a lot of free stuff. Salvation is something that cost God greatly. It, was, it required him to pay a great price, the greatest price perhaps that he could ever give. That was his own son's life. God had to watch his own son, though he was innocent, being humiliated by the very creatures he himself made and had given life to. God the Father had to watch people torture his own son cruelly and unjustly. He had to watch them kill the very person who was sent into this earth as a picture of God's love. He had to watch all that. It was not an easy price that God paid that day. So also it is no small thing that God is keeping in front of you and me today. Salvation is not a joke. And neither is hell. Hell is not a work of fiction. It is not a work of man's imagination. It is real. And many think that once you die, that's it. You just vanish into nothing. That is not true. That's not what the Bible says. But in fact, the Bible says it is the beginning of something far greater. And it begins with judgment. The moment we leave this earth, we close our eyes to this mortal realm. The Bible says that the next thing that happens, of significance at least, is that we stand before God. We stand at his judgment seat. And that is a moment where our future, and by that word future I mean our eternity, is going to be decided. And my friends, it's not going to be decided by our good deeds or its numerosity. It's not going to be decided by the number of verses you and I have studied in Sunday school and memorized in our lifespan. It's not going to be decided by what we call as karma. It is not going to be decided even by positive thinking and you cannot change what God has set in stone by your positive thinking that day. 
it is going to be decided based on one thing alone. Romans chapter 2, verse 16, it refers to that. Romans chapter 2, verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. The author of this epistle says, according to my gospel, and that's the same gospel that you and I are all here now. That gospel is the basis of that judgment that happens once we die. It's our response to that gospel that is going to decide how our eternity is going to look like. Will it be in the fires of hell, which is a picture of God's absolute wrath, and hell has no end as well? Or will it be an eternity in God's presence, one of joy and gladness, one where there is no more pain nor sorrow? And please remember also that this offer of salvation, this gift of salvation, which is given and kept before us today, is there today, but may not be there tomorrow. This offer is time bound. It is not an eternal offer. If you look at the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, I don't have time to dwell upon it, so skipping that. But if you know that story, you'll realize there is no way that once you die, you get to choose again. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it reads like this. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. It doesn't speak of anything else in between. You die, and then there's judgment. The offer is time bound. It's only as long as you and I are here on earth. There is no choice once the gates of death close upon you. And to be frank, you may not even have this choice five minutes from now. It can be that five minutes from this moment, I walk outside of this door, I walk to the intersection there, and there's a car that comes un uncontrolled and in high speed and rams into me and kills me. I cannot guarantee what my next moment in life will look like. Our human bodies are so fragile that a mere air bubble in our bloodstream is enough to kill us. A single unicellular organism, so small that we cannot even see it, is all it takes to end our lives. We all remember what COVID-19 looked like, right? It's not too far in the past, is it? We all know what, how deadly that was and the fear that many of us would have gone through. That's how fragile we are. It only takes a moment for us to see our eyes closed. And that is when this offer expires as well. The gift of salvation is given to us now in this present moment. And remember that if you're here tonight and if you have heard of this Jesus tonight, if you've heard of this call of the gospel to believe in the one who has died for you who has paid the price of your sins of my sins on that cross of Calvary and by simply believing in him you get to have everlasting life remember that if you have heard this right now then for eternity you are without excuse there is no way you can come to God's presence and say I did not know about it now. In fact, those who may never have heard the gospel itself are in Romans chapter 1 said to be people who don't have an excuse. Nobody, no human being has an excuse for not believing in the gospel, for not believing in Jesus Christ. There is no one who will be given an excuse.
So then the question arises, what must I do to receive this salvation? What should I do to receive this salvation? Romans chapter 10, verse 8 to 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 8 through to verse 10. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's as simple and as clear as that. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, it says, you will be saved. Look at verse 11. That's the guarantee of the scriptures. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. That is all you and I have to do to receive this salvation. So as I conclude... Let me just remind you, the choice is there before you. The time is now. The consequences of your choice are real, and much more than that, it is eternal. The question now that remains is just this. What will you choose right now? What will you choose right now? Please, please choose to believe.